Well, welcome everyone to our first delicious, nutritious adventure in the new year. This event is in collaboration with Plant-Based Nutrition Movement. My name is Carrie Bruno. I'm a pharmacist, a PBNM board member, and your host for tonight's event. PBNM, or Plant-Based Nutrition Movement, is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to educate, inspire, and support those moving towards an evidence-based, whole, minimally processed, plant-based way of eating as a way to improve health and quality of life at all ages. This event is open to everyone interested in health and wellness, whether you've never heard about a plant-based diet, you're curious about trying it, or you've been eating this way for a long time. Um, we are all here to learn and help each other, um, help each other along the way. We always can learn and share each other, share with each other information that's helpful and practical to make it easier to start and remain on a plant-based journey. And so with that in mind, these events are going to focus on seasonal ingredients and practical tips, as well as uh, we'll have guest speakers sharing their experiences and healing stories with us. There are many definitions of an adventure, and it may take on a whole new meaning for each individual. However, an important part of most adventures is exploring an area and trying new cuisines. So for these events, we'll be traveling the world, looking to various cultures to learn what similarities and differences make them unique. Each culture uses combinations of herbs, spices, and other ingredients to make their food delicious and nutritious. And we hope you'll take this adventure with us, whatever your meaning and purpose for being here is. Um, this specific event is held monthly on the third Tuesday of the month. And this program will be recorded and available for viewing or sharing on the PBNM YouTube channel. And these events are free to attend, and we do welcome donations to pbnm.org to cover our production costs. And if you'd like to learn more information about this group, PBNM, or, and future events, go to pbnm.org. So with that, let me tell you about our agenda for tonight. We have two speakers with us tonight. Our first speaker is Janet Pearson. She's also a PBNM board member and a one-on-one -on -one plant-based coach. And she'll be starting off with our short seasonal segment. And she'll be sharing information and recipes involving various types of winter squash, and which are definitely readily available this time of year. And then our featured guest for tonight is Deepa Deshmukh. She'll be exploring the power of cultural foods and traditional cooking practices. And she'll be sharing a show and tell of various foods and cooking techniques with us. Uh, after Deepa's presentation, we'll leave about 15 to 20 minutes for questions. Um, everyone except the speakers will be muted throughout the presentation. And we ask that everyone remain muted to avoid interruptions and background noise. So please use, feel, feel, feel free to use the chat box for questions, and we will monitor that throughout the presentation. Um, so without further ado, let's get the event started. Janet, would you like to start us off? Thank you, Carrie. Yes, I'm uh, excited to be here in, in cold January and uh, encourage everyone to get out. And when you see the odd shaping things called winter squashes, try one because they're very delicious. And I want to talk about these two today. They're one small, I'm smaller than the other, but they're both the same. And it's called a delicata squash. And as you can see, they're, you know, you could find them in different sizes, but they're mainly yellow outside and they have green stripes on them. And they're very um, solid. So when you're buying them from the grocery store, you want to pick the, when you lift, when you pick them up in your hand, you want to have them feel almost heavy, almost like when you're picking a watermelon in the summer, you don't want one light, you want one compared to the rest of them, a heavier feel. And uh, it's great if you could find organic because this is one of the few winter squashes, all of the skin is edible and it's great fiber uh, and nutrition in the skin. So I'm gonna talk about that. 
And uh, when you bring it home from the store, the reason winter squashes, there's several different kinds, kombucha squash, which are rounder and dark green, those need to be peeled uh, either before roasting or you could roast those and uh, take the inside, the, the flesh out and scoop it out. But I'm gonna talk about the delicata because it's easy to, it's the easiest to prepare. It's creamy, it's delicious. You could make it in a savory way or you can make it in a sweet way. And I basically found these uh, organic ones at uh, Whole Foods. They're inexpensive, maybe two or three dollars. You could maybe find them on sale. They last about a month in, in your home uh, with the regular temperature, 68 or so, 16, between 67, 68, whatever you keep your kitchen on. But if you have a colder place in your home, like a cold storage, in uh, for those of us who have basements or colder storage, it's recommended to store them between uh, 54 and 59 uh, degrees, and then they'll last about two to three months. So you want to look for firm uh, firm to the touch and then you could either cut them long ways and take out the skin the seeds and then you could roast them and you could roast them with the cut side down on parchment paper and nothing else is needed just 350 for about 25 to 30 minutes maybe 40 at the most and uh, they they get really tender and you could stuff them I have different recipes one of the recipe if you uh, are wanting to do it that way, a stuffed delicata squash. It looks nice as a meal by itself. There's a vegan uh, cream spinach and white bean stuffed delicata squash recipe that I found that's oil-free. And there's also many different roasted recipes that you could um, stuff it with um, orange and thyme uh, seasoning, a chipotle glazed delicata squash, is um, another recipe that I found and also roasted delicata squash with pomegranate and arugula salad. So you could eat it uh, either warm or a uh, cold in a salad. And all of those recipe, specific recipe links could be found in the show notes when you're back looking at the recording on YouTube. And then this is how it looks when you roast it. You just cut it and you could actually keep the seeds, if you could see it, you could keep the seeds inside when you're roasting it. And I liked that idea and when I was researching it, the seeds are edible also. So there's vitamin A and vitamin C in the squash fiber. There's antioxidants that help with your skin. There's selenium, uh, calcium, iron, manganese, zinc even. Uh, thiamine, there's a variety of B, uh, B complex vitamins, but when you uh, roast them with the seeds inside like this, you can actually then eat, you eat, eat the seeds and it's roasting everything together, including the peeling. So you don't have to, uh, you know, you can eat the whole thing, which is kind of easy to make. Or you could take the seeds out, and this is how it looks if you cut the seeds out and then roast it in little kind of arch, little moon-shaped pieces and put them on your salad. So that is um, my demonstration for the delicata squash. So why would you want one? They're delicious. They have vitamins and nutrients and fiber, and they're very low calories. They're only about for a cup. Uh, it's between 50 and uh, 60 calories for a cup. So very low calorie, delicious food. And that's all I have on the Dello Cotta Swatch. And I hope everyone gets one from your store and, or gets a few and while they're in season because they'll be gone very soon. But you, you should be able to still find them. Thanks for, for everyone for being here. And I'll uh, turn over to Carrie.
Perfect. I love the delicata squash. Um, that is, I found like I was talking to you beforehand. I found it a couple of years ago and now it's my favorite. I have not tried it without taking the seeds out. So I will have to try it with cooking those in there next time. So thanks for the tips. <laughs> So our next, our guest speaker tonight is Deepa Deshmukh. Um, in 2020, Deepa was recognized as one of the top 10 dietitians in the country by today's dietitian publication for her innovative approach to health and wellness. Over the last 18 years, Deepa has helped hundreds of people from various ethnic backgrounds lose weight, reverse and manage their diabetes, and reduce their cholesterol and blood pressure levels. Deepa specializes in providing culturally adopted nutrition focused practical and tactical strategies to those who have chosen a path to change lifestyle and to feel better. And tonight she is going to share with us some um, some easy cooking te techniques and um, ingredients that I'm sure you're familiar with and maybe some new uses that you can incorporate for them. So welcome Deepa. Thank you so much, uh, PBNM Group and, and Kerry and Janet and everybody who is here uh, and who will be seeing this podcast or videocast rather uh, once it is recorded and up and running. So I'm super excited when I have to talk about food and, uh, and then I'm super, super excited when I have to show food and I have to cook with it. And uh, because no matter what culture you take, no matter which country you go to, just like we all breathe oxygen, we all eat food. And when you start uh, scoping eating habits, cultural eating habits, I'm not talking about modern eating habits, but cultural eating habits of food, we notice that there are so many similarities between the kind of food groups that we eat. They are pretty much very similar across the board. And uh, just a quick demonstration of that um, to get this presentation started is uh, I'm going to start it by just showcasing or showing you the, <clears throat> the different calorie uh, density pyramids of different cultures that I have uh, created. So uh, if Kerry, can you give me permission to sh share the screen? Okay. I just did, so you should be able okay, to. Okay, perfect. So that being said, I'm quickly going to go over those those calorie density pyramids so that it will be a good visual, and then I'm going to show you the actual food. So just give me a second here. So some of you may be familiar with the concept of calorie density pyramid, but calorie density pyramid basically talks about the calorie density of, of natural food, whole, whole plant-based foods versus, uh, versus uh, super sensational artificial foods. But what I want to focus on is no matter which culture you, you take. So this particular uh, one is... I'm trying to see how to move this black bar from here. Okay, we'll see how this goes. Um, so this is this particular image is based on the foods that we we commonly find for in in United States. And if you look at the the bottom six the most healthiest healthiest food groups you will see. It has spices and then, of course, vegetables and fruits. It has then starches and different kind of beans and, uh, I mean, different kind of uh, uh, grains and, and beans, lentils, so on and so forth. Now, if you go to Asia, if you go to India, for example, you will find same food groups, just slightly different variety. For example, we have different kinds of spices and the vegetables are going to change significantly. You know, the, the tindora or the rich gourds or just like winter squashes here, uh, India has different kind of squashes like opo squash and this, is, this particular squash uh, uh, is, is slightly sour. It's, it comes, it, it's closer to the summer squash 
but has a sour taste and we use it in uh, in in making dals or or legume based dishes and then we have fenugreek leaves in us we are familiar with at least some people are familiar with fenugreek seeds but we use a lot of fenugreek leaves and then there are uh, daikon radish and jackfruit and sapotas and and uh, custard um, apple and different kind of uh, potatoes and all kinds of grains and variety of lentils so now if you go to um, south or african american uh, counties even in united states you will start seeing different kind of fruits and vegetables but again uh, there is a similarity you know they may have different kind of rice than 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 the brown rice or white rice like in in the south they use a lot of wild rice there there is a lot of uh, if you go to africa uh, you see teff and and fonio and sorghum those those kind of uh, grains and the beans are black eyed peas and and uh, red beans if you go to asian countries like china vietnam again you you see similar uh, herbs and spices and the vegetable selection changes based on the soil and the climate and the fruit variety changes it we get into lychees and and dragon fruit and persimmons uh, the eggplants are going to be a little different in in um, asian countries like china and and philippines and korea you will see all kinds of bok choy the uh, the uh, grains are going to be in Uh, red rice and uh, soybeans and different kind of uh, they use a lot of raw soybeans and of course tofu and all other kinds of beans if you go to um, back to the roots here native american pyramid you will see again different kind of squashes the i mean native americans are famous for those three a uh, sister uh, concept where it's it's beans and corn and squash that has been predominantly uh, pa- predominantly part of their diet and that's how native americans have survived so the point of going through these pyramids was that we just went through just and this is just fraction of uh, cultures that i have i i'm, I'm working on 10 other uh, cultures uh, uh, as we speak it takes a lot of time to uh, to study and to read and to understand what these cultures are eating but as i just told you there are so much com- uh, overlap here because we all are uh, relying on spices vegetables fruits roots grains beans and lentils and everything which was at the top of that pyramid was all modern processed food you know uh, nothing much to be talked about that and and that processed food is taking hold in in different parts of the world and and now we are dragging other countries into this epidemic of of uh, chronic diseases so it becomes extremely valuable to talk about the importance of uh, incorporating cultural foods and and the reason that these foods are part or have been part of different cultures different i mean all kinds of all human beings for centuries now you know we are not talking about just 50 years ago humans have survived on this kind of food for 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 hundreds of years is because these are nutrient dense foods you know and and thank god that the uh that we haven't turned rice into into something uh where the original rice is not available thankfully some beans and some grains and some starches and some vegetables are still available in in the form and shape which is pretty close to uh not pretty close but at least in some shape and form to the original original form however in order to grow all these vegetables and 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 um, uh, and grains we need we need uh, natural resources so unless animal consumption goes down and water consumption 
uh, for that goes down, it's going to be difficult to grow all these things. That's why it is exciting to see more and more people consuming more plant-based because that's what is going to keep the demand for plants up, uh, demand for, for carbohydrates or starches up. Because as, as we all know how carbophobic our 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 society is everybody is afraid of eating potatoes and rice and and different kind of grains because they think oh my god they are going to just die tomorrow if they eat a potato or a bowl of rice because they they look at these foods as as uh, weight gaining or, or root cause of their their weight what has happened is beans lentils they are in a slightly different categories of, of protein and they uh, but when it comes to rice and potatoes plantains people are so afraid to eat that because of their uh, because they feel oh, that, that's the that's the reason why they have diabetes and weight loss well they are not the culprits we have taken the rice added oil and ghee and turned it into biryani you know along with spices and the biryani uh, is is uh, obviously color calorically dense so it's not the it's not the rice that is making you um, gain weight but it's the oil and ghee that you put on same thing with potato we took the potato and start start started frying it or putting sour cream on top or or cheese on top or um, i don't know cream on top and turn the the low calorie food a nutrient dense low calorie food into highly processed high caloric value and low nutrient food so so if we stick to the original uh, ingredients they are absolutely as crucial to us as as oxygen to us you know they are our our lifeline but when we get into adding uh, flavors by adding sugar salt and fat that's when we get into trouble so that being said uh, I'm just going to show you uh, the most common beans, lentils, uh, grain flours, etc., that we use in 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 uh, Indian kitchen. Uh, and mine is kind of a global kitchen. I travel everywhere, wherever I go, no matter which part of the world I'm in. The first thing I do is I go to the farmers market and literally. Uh, grab hold of whoever is there who, who can speak English and, and ask them what kind of beans and lentils they use. And then I bring that back with me, you know, and uh, that's how I, I learn what, what has been out there. So, but we'll start with the Indian kitchen. The core of making flavorful food is herbs and spices. And most Indian, if, all Indian kitchens, if not most of them, we all have this one um, a box of spices, I guess, but it's always a round box and it, it has these small little uh, sections in there. And these are, uh, these are some of the core spices that we use. We always have black mustard. How can I, how can we live with our turmeric? You know, there was no concept of turmeric tablets in traditional cooking it was all this is it this was a, this was our uh, nature cvs or walgreens you know this was our pharmacy all the spices then you have cayenne um cumin and uh, coriander powder and uh, fenugreek whole fenugreek and then some whole spices such as um, uh, cinnamon and black pepper and cloves. So, and then there are tons of uh, spice mixes in my cabinet, such as garam masala and curry powder and sambar powder. They all are uh, basically co combination and permutation of different spices, but these are the core, core spices. One thing that is missing because I'm out of it, is it, oh no that it's right here it's cumin okay so if i want to do a quick stir fry these are the some basic things uh, pretty much every indian will use to put things together so the the, the uh, this is where the that's the first thing we take it out when we start cooking and then to actually 
make what is called as tadka or tempering, we use this little little uh, gadget here. It's nothing but a uh, a cast iron bowl which has this long ha handle to it, and you put it on the stove and allow it uh, uh, allow this to get very hot. And th this particular technique is called as tadka because the the uh, talking about the cultural differences uh, in terms of using spices, Indians use spices during cooking, okay? Mexican uh, uh, culture uses spices or they add spices on top, like the cumin is added in the end, the cayenne is added in the end. The Indian people use cumin and cayenne and everything during cooking. And and uh, the way to, the way Indians, um, extract the the flavor out of out of spices is by warming up this little uh, iron ladle you can call and you traditionally oil is added now of course i'm oil free guys i hope one thing you take it from being part of pbnm is learn to cook whole food plant based no oil if there is oil and fat in your diet you will not get the most benefits from this diet that this diet is supposed to give you. Okay, so cutting down on oil should be the priority on everybody's list. Uh, nonetheless, so uh, traditionally oil is added here. Obviously, I don't add oil. And once this is hot enough, you start by uh, adding popping mustard. And as soon as you add the whole mustard, it will start to pop up. It will, you know, you will have to put a little lid on it. By the way, this tarka uh, technique is available on my my YouTube channel, so you don't have to take notes. Just just enjoy the show here, um, and then you can add. Uh, well, you can add garlic. You can add red pepper, uh, dry red pepper. You can add uh, whichever other spice you want, and then lower the lower the heat. And remember, almost in spices, spices are 60 to 80% oil, okay? That's where those all those essential oils come from. So when you heat, heat up the spice, the flavor that you get is because that, that the, the flavoring agent, the flavoring compound in the spice and the fat which is already in the spice is, is kind of doing its magic. Therefore, you don't need to add extra oil to extract the flavor. And and then we and then we uh, you can use this tarka on top of your dal or your beans, or you can put it on top of your salad. There are many ways of uh, of uh, using this tarka. Now, if you don't have this, no worries. The large company makes this little little skillet. So you can use that, you know. So that's another thing I do is anywhere I go, I try to get at least anything that is cast iron, I, I put it in my suitcase. Um, so this is a this is a nice little uh, skillet that you can buy in any, in, in Target or any store uh, to, to bloom your spices or to uh, flavor, I mean, to extract the flavor or make tadka. Another thing, another little gadget that we use is just pestle and mortal and, and make fresh, just, you know, crush the garlic or if you want cumin, just crush it. Now, believe it or not, this is almost 90 years old uh, little thing from my grandmother. My grandmother is 104, walking and talking and uh, doing all sorts of things. But uh, this was uh, this is something that she gave it to me, and uh, you will find uh, find this mortal and pestle in all Indian households as well as uh, all cultures. I have seen it in Italy. I have seen it in Mexico. I have seen it in uh, um, uh, in Portugal. Pretty much everybody, because again, we all are using spices, so we need something to crush these spices. So you will find having this gadget also helps because. It, it, you don't want to, um, I mean, you know, the blender and, and all those things, coffee coffee, uh, uh, coffee grinder, those are all, all good, but they still require you to put at least two tablespoons of whole spice in it. But if you just want to do half a teaspoon, you have something and 
all these cooking techniques, pounding, crushing, uh, mixing with your hand, improve your uh, fine motor skills, which is another, another good exercise for your brain, for your fingers, uh, for your eyes. So the more you play around with food, the more you touch it, the more we sque squeeze things, the better it is for our, our, our muscle development. And if you are frustrated, this is a good thing. You can really pound it uh, to paste. So it's a stress, it's a stress management uh, technique as well. Now we'll get into beans. I don't know, I couldn't find enough space because I have so many beans, but I just got, got out some uh, unique ones. So this particular lentil is called as moth beans. They are very similar to uh, mung beans and uh, moth beans, another nutritional uh, powerhouse, it can be sprouted very easily. It has a slightly sweeter taste and uh, rich in iron and calcium and all kinds of things. So moth beans are something worth exploring. Now, uh, the common dal that most Indian household use is uh, households use is is called is called as or is made from tur dal. Okay, this is like this is very different than the pink lentils or yellow lentils, and uh, this is this is pretty much decorticated pigeon um, pigeon piece, but it's decorticated. You also get decorticated in the sense the skin is removed. But this is the most kind of most uh, common mm, dal or split uh, legume that is that is used. Now the difference between uh, uh, whole lentil and dal is that dal is split and usually uh, decorticated or corticated. And, and bean is whole. So for example, this is moth bean, but if, if, if you buy the split ones, it's called moth dal. So that's the difference. So dal is, dal you make it by splitting the lentils. Uh, th these are uh, black urad lentil. Now this is a, again, this is a moon dal. It's, um, it is with skin and the, the unique property of moong dal is it ferments really well and it also has little bit of uh, uh, that gluten, glutenish ability to give texture to, to the pancake or if you're making a wrap. So if you, if there are any, um, fans of Indian food here, and if you have been to an Indian restaurant and have ever ordered dosa or uttappa, which is like this huge crepe, or if you have ordered those steamed idlis, they all are, they are the, one of the main ingredient is this urad dal because it's, it's, a, it's an acidic fermented product and urad dal ferments really well. Now we all are familiar with Chickpeas, but Indian chickpeas are brown in color and they are tiny. And uh, again, they, they cook really well. You can sprout them. All these beans, they sprout really well. And you, some of you probably already know what chana dal is. It's a split chickpea, but again, it's a, it's a small chickpea. It's not the huge chickpea. Now, this one is a unique one, difficult to find. And, you know, I wish you guys were really in my kitchen right now. I get so excited. Um, these are um, black peas, okay? How we have green, yellow, green peas and yellow peas, these are not even black. They have a unique like blackish, brownish, uh, almost like a uh, precious stone type of a color to it. And uh, they come from one unique region uh, from Western part of India. 
and they cook really fast, really well. Uh, they have their own little sweeter uh, flavor to it and you just put a little bit of uh, coconut and cumin, coriander powder and tomatoes and you, you instant pot it and they are done. Now, we know the white chickpeas. I just showed you the uh, black or brown chickpeas. Now, these are pink chickpeas. Okay. Uh, another really nice legume to start. So these are pink chickpeas. And uh, that's that's pretty much I have, but I have at least another four, five, three to four varieties in my pantry. But now you get the idea that, you know, these, these things are uh, unique to India, but I have also seen um, variety of basically beans and peas and lentils in different parts of the world. Now, when it comes to grains, uh, depending on the region uh, where where you are visiting India, you will see different kind of grains. I come from western or southern part of India, and we use a lot of millets, and we make uh, how how Mexicans make tortillas. We make similar. It's a similar um, uh, cooking process, making process, but just made out of millet flour, and the kind of millet that we, we get in India. This one is called as jawar flour. And uh, it's it's a flour and you add water and pretty much make it or turn it into a tortilla uh, type of bread. So that was jawar flour. This is bajra flour. And uh, on my YouTube channel, I do cook using all these traditional ingredients. So you can always learn recipes there. Now this one is another hidden gem. It's called ragi flour. Now ragi has three times more calcium than milk. Okay. There's a reason why my grandmother and her friends are still alive. Every morning they eat porridge made out of ragi. And we have very, at least Indians used to have very low incidence of osteoporosis in spite of having low dairy consumption for a long period of time. Obviously, they have lost that edge because now the dairy consumption has gone up, meat consumption has gone up, sodium consumption has gone up, fat consumption has gone up, modern food has sneaked in. And as a result, all these things are, are um, basically falling apart. Uh, 10 years ago, I got hold of this company and work with, not work with them, just really beg them to come up with these flowers and, 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 and gluten-free and stuff like that. And now the company has grown a lot and, you know, the, their products are easily available. But even like when I spoke to them the first time, they didn't believe me. They said, who is going to eat all this? You know, um, nobody except you come to us asking for these things. I said, just believe me, it's coming. Well, it took 14 years, but it's here. <laughs> so finally, plant-based is here. Um, so these are different kind of grains and flowers and things like that we use. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, what else? That's pretty much uh, my show and tell is, um, and like Janet was saying, you know, uh, pretty much um, every part of the, of, of the plant is used. We do not. We do not throw seeds, skin, root, bark, leaf, um, stem, nothing goes wasted. Uh, the, uh, Janet was showing the seeds inside the, inside the squash. We know how to make chutney out of it. Okay, and we will, we can, uh, my, uh, using the skin, my, uh, I know my my uh, my family, my mom, uh, they they make another chutney out of it, or like a dipping, like a dip out of it. Uh, if nothing else, they take all this um, uh, not so tender uh, skin of, of of a vegetable or a bark or a root, and they boil it and they make it into broth. 
they don't know what it what this the, that it is called as broth but they call it a soup and and then everybody uh, gets to drink one cup of that broth every every day or they will use it to make dal and stuff like that so all cultures are very frugal uh, with their resources with their food food waste is almost none you know um, I think here we we waste too much food. When I see my patients, uh, um, I get to see their uh, food log, which is picture based food log, and I see that they are they, their cucumbers don't have skin and potatoes don't have skin. It really hurts me. I I keep telling them, please eat seeds, please eat skin, and they're like, why, why, why? And I said, that's where the nutrients are. That's where the flavor is. You know, um, there's a reason why there's a skin because skin is the protective uh, um, uh, filament for that fruit and vegetable. And and it, it's, that's the strongest part, you know, and that's where all the nutrients are concentrated to fight the outside world. So that's where all the all the, your antioxidants and polyphenols and all that is situated. So please do not eat. Please do not stop. Uh, I mean, uh, peel the. Your cucumbers and apples and squashes and, you know, it's okay. You will have to chew more. It's good for you. It's good for your digestion. It's not going to kill you. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of my show and tell. And uh, thank you. And I will take some questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. I was actually going to ask you the question about the spices in um, and blooming them. I think that's the correct term and not using yeah. oil. One of my yeah. coworkers recently um, gave me the tip of blooming them, but he uses oil. Um, and yeah. I like the little cast iron tip of the cast iron skillet. I think I'm going to have to invest in one of those. Oh, yeah, please. It, it's, it's uh, you know, the Santa will be very happy. Just $5 uh, gift. You know, so, so a, a question regarding that for people who don't have the cast iron, can you like if you're making kind of a um, a stir fry or like you're starting with maybe onions or garlic, can you put the spices in with the onions and garlic or will that not have the same effect as blooming them by themselves? So, you know, I have a, a long answer for it uh, in my uh, YouTube video. Okay, I would highly uh, recommend you to uh, to watch my older YouTube videos when I started because that's where I gave lot of lot of information about the science behind it. But to answer your question quickly, you can take a skillet, okay, and and at least the, the traditionally we start by blooming the mustard seeds and and cumin seeds. That's the traditional, if you're cooking Indian food, and that is what is called as tadka, that's step number one. You can do that in skillet, which is fine. And then you don't have to add uh, the um, uh, coriander powder or garam masala in, in that, and then you can stir fry your onions and tomatoes. However, when it's time to add your um, other spice powders, you, you want to move the onion and tomatoes on the side and add and make sure that the, that the spices are receiving the heat a bit. Okay, because onion and tomatoes have water in it. Then the, then the water and fat and, and the flavors are going to collide. So the spices need to be directly exposed to the heat just for 30 seconds. It, it doesn't take that long, okay. 10 seconds even. You will, you will get the flavor, you, you will smell it. That's when you know, oh, okay, the spice has arrived and then you can mix everything. Um, this little thing is, you know, for example, let's say you cook uh, lentils in, 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 in instant pot and by adding this tempering on top, it just makes it easy. Again, um, cultures are very innovative. This not only makes the tadka, but it is also a serving utensil. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. So, <laughs> so they they do that, and then there is uh, if 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 they want to call somebody like my grandmother, take this and bangs it on the table so somebody pays attention to her. So right. this has lot of uh, purposes. Uses. Yeah. yeah.
So someone um, in the comments was asking, where can someone get one of those like long cast iron spoons? Oh, Are I know. Available? So I, I get like every time I go to India, I get 10 and I give it away to people. This is my wedding gift. Uh, I, you know, very weird wedding gift, but the bride and groom always remember me. Um, uh, so this is very slightly difficult to get, especially in this format. You can go to Indian store, but they have it modern, like nonstick and all mm -hmm. kinds of jazz, which is not needed. But the the next best thing to that would be this this little uh, large uh, skillet. Okay, and I know those are easy to find. <laughs> those are, that's easy. Yes. Mm -hmm. So one other question, you were showing the different types of flowers and someone had asked how do you had mentioned that I think your mother makes a cereal with the, one of the flowers. Um, someone was asking how to do that and which type okay. of flower that was. Uh, so it was a ragi flower or you can make it with buckwheat flour and it's a porridge. You cook it just like oatmeal, just uh, taking water, bringing it to boil and just sprinkling a little bit of this flour in it until it becomes... Uh, a, a porridge or almost like a glue. That's it. Nothing fancy. Okay. And then they add uh, cardamom and, and saffron and, you know, you can add cinnamon. You can uh, stir in a spoonful of honey or uh, any dry fruit if you want. Okay. Nice. Um, and then one other question I had. Um, so obviously we all know um, that we would like to avoid the oils as much as possible, but how do you feel about coconut? I know Indian cooking uses a lot of coconut and that can be higher in fat as well. For sure, coconut is the, is the, has the um, most amount of saturated fat, the artery clogging fat. Um, well, what can I say? Coconut oil is definitely a no-no, okay? But if you're using whole coconut, shredded coconut, fresh shredded coconut, you can get away by using maybe one to two teaspoons in your curry or in, in your cooking. Uh, because coconut oil, just like peanut oil and olive oil, it's an isolated product, it's an extracted product, it's a concentrated source of, of fat. But coconut, uh, those of you who know how the coconut looks from inside and, and if you have ever tried grating it, it, it has a little bit of fiber in it. So you don't, you are not using the free, you are not getting the free oil by, by using the fresh coconut. So uh, I would, use one to two teaspoons at the most, but don't go crazy with it. And then I believe Karen has her hand up if she has a question, if you want to unmute yourself and ask. Thanks so much. I have a question. Um, I'm kind of like you in that I go to these places wherever I am and I buy things, but then I don't know what to do with them. Sure. So I bought this something called Kodo Millet. Yes, Kodo Millet. Yes. I heard, I heard that it was really easy to digest. Correct. Um, and it's, but I don't know what to do with it. So you <laughs> so cook was, just like rice. Just the same, like two to one ratio or something? Two to one or? ratio. Uh, see, what happens is sometimes with millet, depending on how old it is, the water to uh, millet, I mean, the water to dry millet ratio might change a bit, but two to one is a good, or maybe one, Maybe one cup of millet and one and a half cup of water would be a right one to start. If you feel okay. it's little tough, just throw in more hot water. If get if it gets little too, if it it gets overcooked, it's just going to be a little mushy. No big deal. Uh, you can still eat it. Uh, and and um, when in doubt, always turn everything into like a veggie burger. So that's where all the mushy stuff goes in. And I have one more. Something okay. I bought called buckwheat grain, but it's the whole buckwheat. It looks like, oh. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? I can, oh, I know exactly what the buckwheat is. I have like 50 okay. pounds here. Um, oh. so, <laughs> uh, I also could do some volunteer cooking work for uh, older, uh, older population, okay. you know, who are not able to cook. So I try to cook for them uh, along with my, a couple of my friends. So we have, 
grains and beans in 50 pound uh, buckets here. So first you want to make sure if it is roasted buckwheat or it's a raw buckwheat. I think this is okay. It's a, it's a raw buckwheat. Okay. So short answer is going to be go on my YouTube channel and look for buckwheat bread. If it is raw, go for the buckwheat bread. It's a one single ingredient bread. It's a fermented bread. Very easy to make. So that's one use of it. And the, from the same batter, you can make buckwheat uh, crepes, like buckwheat pancake. So that's another uh, use. And I think I have a recipe. If it's kasha, which is roasted buckwheat, that, that is a little uh, lighter in taste and a little crunchy. So you can use it as a granola. You can put it on your salad. You can uh, almost use it as a topper. Okay. I've had kasha before, but I've never done the whole grain. So I yeah. will check, I'll check it out. Thank you. Good. No, thank you for sharing those. Um, and it looks like, okay, so we have a couple more questions in the chat. So Yvonne is asking, is eating flour a problem for people with diabetes? No. I mean, if it's a single uh, whole grain flour, uh, it is not, especially if you're not adding any fat, you are not uh, stuffing it with some chicken, meat, cheese, it should be fine. Okay. And then it looks like Julia has a couple questions. If you want to unmute Julia and ask them, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, um, those, um, um, sorry, lent, no, not lentils. Um, you, you said moth beans? Oh, moth beans, yeah. Where can I find those? I'd love to try those. Sure. Where do you live? Uh, I I have been to Patel Brothers. Can I find sure. them at Patel Brothers or no? You can find them at Pat Patel Brothers. Okay, because I haven't seen it. So um, yeah. I love Patel Brothers. So um, and then the other ones that um, so probably I would be able to find them at Patel Brothers, right? Most of them you will be able to find uh, Patel Brothers. There are a couple like this black uh, uh, Black peas are not, you won't find them there because if they come from a very uh, small region. So there are just a couple other beans and lentils that I showed you. This pink is, occasionally I have seen it, it's not always stopped. Uh, mm -hmm. But believe me, there, he has plenty other that you can try. Um. Well, this one is not a, oh, so I do have a question, but I just wanted to yeah. add that a ragi flour. Yes. I add it to, to everyone. I add it to pancakes um, and everybody loves it. No one can taste it. Like I just, everybody loves it. I definitely recommend to add that flour to like pancakes and waffles and whatever. So, um, and then my other question is, where can we find nutritional information on some of those traditional Indian foods? Because I feel like it's not very accessible online like let's see if i wanted to look up nutritional information for ragi flour and you mentioned it's rich in calcium so what are the, the credible sources where we can look it up because i feel now like you are asking a very difficult question i'm going to show you something so yeah. i graduated i i graduated from the college 31 years ago okay okay this is the nutritional fact cook uh, fact book that that uh, we used in the college when i came to us this mm -hmm. is one thing that i brought with me really not knowing what i'm going to do with it but i'm glad i did and this is it i mean it's 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 in the book and sometime i try to go to their website national institute of nutrition uh, sometimes the website is working, sometimes the website is not working. So if you are absolutely stuck, give me a call. I will look for it and I'll let you know. Uh, yes, absolutely. Because it's just, um, there are a lot of websites, uh, but yeah. I don't feel like they're credible. It's just like Correct. specifically for Indian stuff. And I'm Correct. very interested. So thank you so much. No problem. All right. I have a question. I have a question. Um, oh, yeah. um, regard, regarding the high calcium breakfast that your mom 
Uh, or eats for breakfast. How do you spell that flower? I've never heard of it. It is R A G I. I and, uh, no, R is yeah. in Robert. Oh, R A G I. Okay. Yes, Ragi. And uh, I am trying to talk to a company in India where they have it cooked and dried so we can just add like water to it or add it to the smoothie because the the raw flour does have a little bit of a raw taste to it and you have to cook and you know so i'm trying to i'm hoping that company thing will come through and if that happens i will let you guys know where to buy it and stuff like that oh so right now you just buy well, right now you can just get the raw one from the from the store but i'm just letting letting you know that i'm trying to see how i how i can make it even more accessible to people so it would be like making oatmeal out of oat flour instead of oatmeal would that kind correct of... I, or you can blend it you can cook it with your oats oh blend it with oats okay yeah correct thanks no problem so we have another question in the chat um, so, and the topic is protein and aging. So do daily protein needs increase as people get older? And if so, what would be the recommended daily grams of protein for older adults? So if you're in good health, uh, usually it is 0.8 grams per kg body weight or one gram per kg body weight, which, whichever it is, it usually comes down to 50, 60 grams of protein. Uh, you don't need protein powders, anything like that. Just eat more of beans, lentils, rice, starches, vegetables. That's all. Perfect. Um, so one question I had, it seems like there are definitely some adventurous uh, members in this group that have gotten some of those rare ingredients and are trying to figure out what to do with them. But maybe for someone who hasn't done a whole lot of Indian cooking, what is something simple that you would recommend that would combine maybe, or I mean, it could use grains and or beans separately, but is there a simple recipe that you would recommend people start with? Um, so if you, if you are into, if you are into soups, you can make a lentil soup that, that will be the easiest one, uh, you know, and you can have it with rice. Mm -hmm. If you are into potatoes, okay, uh, if you're into starch based diet and really trying to, uh, get your health under control, then you can stir fry cooked potato with few spices like cumin uh, or or a little bit of uh, coriander powder and onion tomatoes and it makes a delicious side dish you know and that's easy you don't need it's like any other stir fry it's filling it's easy potatoes are cheap cumin and coriander powders are easily available uh, just a little bit of turmeric and just stir fry the potatoes and yeah, you can start there. Okay, great. I love potatoes, so I might give that a try. <laughs> um, because remember, spices do not always mean hot food. Mm -hmm. Not all the spices are hot. Not all the spices give heartburn. I think people get heartburn after eating spices because those spices because of the, the the meat and the oil that they these spices are cooked in. So it's not the spice that is giving people heart heart uh, not heart attack but heartburn. It's because how they are cooked. Yeah. I see that with my patients all the time. They come in, my Indian patients come in and they say, "Oh, I stopped eating spicy food because of the heartburn," and I said, "Oh my God." How 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 can you how is that possible? But as soon as they start cooking the the Indian food without oil, things change. Yeah, and I think spices can provide so many other nutrients that you yeah. can't find anywhere else. So yeah. yeah, like it's not about the spice level and the heat, um, but a lot of those spices are beneficial in many other ways. 
Correct. And you cannot capture all those in the capsules. I mean, turmeric capsule and cumin powder capsule and, you know, that is not how, how we are intended or how we are uh, designed to absorb the spices. It has to be natural uh, uh, through whole foods or natural sources of food. And there is a concept of synergy that different the, the foods interact with each other and that's what makes it uh, a, a, a beneficial nutrient dense food. It's no different than than a um, uh, team sport, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's no different than this community here. If I was the only person talking about whole food, whole food, whole foods, nobody will listen to me. But we all come together, and now it's 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 powerful. It's it's beautiful. That's exactly how food works. It works in synergy. Yep, I love that analogy. I have then, a question yeah. about uh, curries. Yeah. Yes. That if when I go to restaurants, I'm confused, I tell them I like mild, like not hot from chilies, and it's always too spicy, even though they say it's mild, but there's yellow, there's green, there's different colors. Could you give us a kind of an outline of, is it just similar to, like I, I'm familiar with Mexican food, green chill, green salsa, red salsa, is, is that the basic difference? There's just different basic ingredients or could you tell us a little more about the curries you know the the whole uh meaning of curry has been very diluted it's like pizza in united states the pizza that you get in italy is so different <laughs> you know is uh, it's like it's like uh so the curry here is i don't think they know what to call it so they just call it curry who knows what that is you know in india actually we don't have eat that much curry <laughs> not all the regions eat curry okay the i guess the indian cooking has lot of gravies okay and what they want to say is oh this dish has it's a gravy based dish okay they started calling it curry, but now we have a curry powder that, that you get in, in the store. Now, that that is just one version of curry powder. Most Indian households don't have curry powder. We have different kind of spice blends. Okay. And they are not called as curry powder. They are called as masalas. Okay. So... When you go to the Indian restaurants here, I agree with you. They don't listen and they just, you know, they 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 don't know what mild spicy is, I think. And you just have to keep telling them, them and hope for the best. I, I wish I had a better answer for you. But uh, so they like the, the 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 typical Indian menu is what chickpea curry and and spinach curry, but that spinach dish aloo spinach doesn't really have any curry powder in it. It's, you know, uh, it's it's a ginger garlic tomato onion based based dish. The chickpea masala is again it's 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 just chickpeas in a in a gravy. So I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. Uh, there is an Indian restaurant in Naperville. It's called A to B. Okay. And that's a Southern Indian uh, specialty restaurant. And you will get the biggest dosa, the crepe that you have ever seen. It's this big. Now, one thing you have to tell him that you want it with less oil. Uh, they cannot make their curries less oil, but they will be able to make that dosa and all their um, the uttapas, which are like pancakes with less oil, that they can make it. But that is, if it's not the healthiest place in town, but just for experience, you can go and visit at least once. I recently went to uh, my, I have a, a younger son and he, he loves Indian food. He likes the spice. So we went a few weeks ago 
to a little restaurant in Tinley Park. And I said, you know, do you have anything vegan? And they looked at me like, you know, I hear horns, but um, or antennas. So they said, oh, we have two things. So I thought I was getting one thing. He gave me both of them. They were both hot. I, they were like gravies. He said one was green, one was red. They were both too spicy. So I had a little bit with the pita bread. I brought them home. I yeah. used that gravy with potato. I put it in, I made a big pot with those, that gravy. Yes. And I put potatoes and uh, cauliflower and carrots and it was, and chickpeas. And it was uh, good for me after I put all the other vegetables in it. So, but it had oil in it, even though I told him that I didn't want oil. So no, was, I don't think like, they understand the term vegan. You have to tell them you cannot have anything with milk, like milk and yogurt. Um, um, it's really sad uh, uh, statement to make. But when I travel to India, if I'm at home or when I go to somebody's house, food is not a problem. But if I'm traveling, finding vegan food is becoming harder and harder because of they are just changing their habits so much, so quickly, and they are catering to mainstream, uh, which is demanding meat and oil and 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 eggs and dairy based products. So um, it it gets it it is really getting harder and harder. But when I'm at home, uh, the, the person who comes to um, uh, help in the kitchen, she thinks that I'm here for I I'm there for fancy food. But I just tell her, no, please make this using this these ingredients. And she thinks I I I am from Mars. She thinks, why why this is this is no uh, this is no good. Even the dog won't eat it. She says <laughs> because they think there is no taste to this food, which is really bad. But that's the that's the hole that fat, sugar, and salt has on human brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to kind of rethink that and incorporate the spices more, like you were saying earlier. Then there's flavor. Sure. Yes, they, yes, and and uh, all these ancient cultures, they they have really figured out food as medicine, nutrition is medicine approach, but it is getting so diluted. You know, it is it has become uh, so far removed. They have come so far away from that that core concept and and taking them back to it is, is a challenge. Yeah. But again, like I said, more power in numbers. So hopefully yes. it can be done. Yes, we are gonna shift the needle. <laughs> Little group one, yes. Tell us, and you said you had uh, videos on your YouTube channel. Tell us a little about uh, what your website is and how we find more of your videos. So if you if you uh, search on YouTube nutritionist Deepa, my channel will pop pop up and you know you can see some of the. Um, Sometimes I make traditional. I, it's kind of fusion. I make it using what I have, and uh, different versions of it or something that I have learned uh, during my travels everywhere. So that's that's what that is. If you want to get of my newsletter, just send a text to 630-686-7300. And I, every week uh, we have a newsletter that goes out and I talk about the ingredient or a, something about meal planning, anything that I feel that uh, that week my patient is has asked me, so I try to answer. Well, and do you, work, do you work with a, um, a physician group or do you work independently? What do you, how do you help your patients? So I work independently. I have been working, uh, uh, name of my practice is DuPage Dietitians. And I have been in practice for the last 18, 19 years on my own, uh, along with a dietitian who specializes in eating disorders. Uh, I am the one who has been doing whole food plant-based for uh, uh, 
for diabetes and weight loss and heart health, basically chronic diseases and digestive health. And uh, uh, I just help patients with, uh, we have some personalized programs to reverse or prevent. That's my goal. And uh, we have, I have pretty good success when patient follows through. Did you have a, how did you first hear about plant-based and how long have you been plant-based? And did you have a, a health issue or how did you get involved with the plant-based world? So I, um, I came to U.S. in 1993 and uh, I started volunteering at a uh, Harvard affiliated hospital in Boston. Uh, at the nutrition department. And I started observing what they would feed the patients and the whole concept of hospital food and grocery stores was extremely new to me. It was the first time ever I saw a, a grocery aisle that was dedicated for breakfast. And it was all boxed breakfast because we never had the concept of breakfast food. It was you eat rice and beans that are cooked or different kinds of different. We have hundreds of variety. My 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 food life was never boring. Every day, two two three different meals, all homemade, uh, using different ingredients. But nobody said hey, this is your breakfast food. Next day you would get the similar food for lunch or dinner. You know, so it was just food. Somebody would just cook food. And um, that was my first insight into public health. I, I thought that if I go to go back to school here, I will learn about nutrition because I thought America being modern country, you know, I will learn more. Maybe they know more than what I learned in India. So I went back to school, I graduated. And when I started practicing, I saw that my patients were not improving. And I said, why are they not improving as much as I thought I would uh, uh, I would see, you know, because I learned about, so to speak, nutrition. Um, and I said, this doesn't make sense. So I kind of went back to my core and started introducing, talking to people about these beans and lentils and this and that, because I, I, I used to feel very, or telling somebody, hey, you know, instead of eating whole whole uh, uh, oats, go and buy Cheerios. You know, I just felt something odd about uh, prescribing packaged food. And then I started noticing that people's digestive health started getting better. And, and they, they would say, oh, I, I have little more energy and things like that. So it was literally, literally through observation, I came to conclusion that they just need to eat this food. And I just kept promoting that. I created meal plans and things like that, uh, utilizing these herbs and spices. And then I used to feel the food that they're eating like mac and cheese. I said, oh my God, how could you even look at that thing? Forget about eating it every night with so much excitement, you know? and so I started talking about herbs and spices and things like that, just without any uh, intentional uh, or any uh, anything that, oh, I want to convert them to whole food plant based. It wasn't my plan. I didn't even know there was this kind of term until four, three, four years ago, you know, and that's it. So I've been kind of practicing. Uh, it just happened uh, organically. Could you repeat your uh, your phone number for the text? Someone said they didn't get the number. Could you go ahead and give yes, us the other text? 630-686-5500. Mm -hmm. And you want us to text our email to you? Yeah, just Maybe text yeah, yeah, just text newsletter and my admin will add them in. They will ask them for their name and email. Yeah, if they email uh, and, and uh, to that number, we can add them to the uh, to the uh, list. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay. 
any other question? I don't know. Something popped up. Um, yeah, there is one more. Um, does blooming the spices at high temperature harm the oils in the spices, making them less beneficial? Correct. Good, very good question. So you don't want to expose them to super high heat. You want to, uh, again, watch my video to understand the exact technique. Uh, but you want to heat up the heat up the uh, this uh, whatever cast iron pan or any skillet and turn it down that that uh, hot skillet is good enough for it to uh, extract the flavor you don't need the heat underneath it all the time then it will burn Iron when it gets burnt is <laughs> okay. Anything, anything else, Kerry? Um, no, I think that's all that I can see in the comments. Um, so yeah, to wrap things up a little bit, um, I just want to thank everyone that is uh, here live or anyone that will be watching the recording. Um, thank you so much, Deepa. I learned a lot. I love Indian food, but I'm definitely ex inspired to go try some new things. <laughs> And I just have a question for somebody. There was some some person from Hawaii. If she could text me, I am working on that food pyramid, the calorie density pyramid for Hawaiian foods, for that for a native uh, Hawaiian population, because that population is also at a very high risk for uh, diabetes and obesity. So uh, I'm working on that. So picking her brain about the what the state of food there would be interesting. So if, if that person is still here if, and if she could uh, text me, email me, that would be great. I would appreciate that. Yeah. All right, well, um, thanks again, everyone for being here. We invite you, uh, well, this recording will be uh, uploaded to the YouTube channel and we invite you to use the show notes uh, with all the quick links that we'll put in there for recipes um, that we've talked about tonight. Um, and we all encourage you to try something new, experience a new flavor, a spice blend, a recipe, or just in a different ingredient. Um, and feel free to comment on the YouTube uh, channel and share what action you decided to take and how it went. Um, and before we say goodbye, I would like to tell you about our program for next month. So we are excited to welcome Angela Fischetti as our guest speaker. Angela is a virtual physical fitness and yoga instructor and a massage therapist specializing in wellness for older adults. Uh, have you ever been on the go with limited space and still want to fit in some exercise? Well, look no further. Angela will demonstrate a workout for us that is perfect for this scenario and that trains every muscle group, large or small. Um, the date for that event is Thursday the 29th. This is different than our usual third Tuesday of the month. Um, so that one will be again Thursday the 29th. And we're also going to be having a special bonus event next month since our events typically take place on the third Tuesday and our normal event will take place a different night. We're going to have a special event um, on the third Tuesday and it will be there won't be any live component to it. It'll just be recorded and put on YouTube. Um, but we will we will do our best to promote that so that people know when it's being posted. Um, our guests for that event will be Jill Keb and Kathy Taylor. And they're going to be sharing their plant-based health stories and a quick and easy tofu bake or tofu recipe. Um, so they will be joining us live on. Uh, or they will be joining us on February 20th. So to wrap that all up, there's going to be the live event on February 29th, and then the pre-recorded event that will be posted on YouTube on February 20th. Um, so we hope to see everyone back for those for those events and invite a friend to join you. Have and a good night, Karen, everyone. Yeah. Karen, before you say goodbye to everyone, if they're not already a member of PBNM, could you go ahead and let them know how to be on our mailing list so they could um, be up to date on our newsletter? Yeah. So if you'd like to 
sign up for our newsletter or learn about more events or PBNM in general, you can go to pbnm.org. And on the top of this page, there is a become a member uh, tab and you can select that, put in your email and other information it may ask you for. And that's basically just um, putting yourself on our mailing list so that we can send you our newsletter and any updates on events that we have planned. Great. And I know there was someone that mentioned, Julia had mentioned that she had put in her email and did not, still are not getting the newsletters. If anybody runs into that problem, you can, um, you can, th I think there's an email on the website. You can send an email to them, or I can put my email address in the chat um, and anyone can get a hold of me if, um, if they have that issue as well. They could also any any questions that anyone has. If you look at um, the volunteer form, if they fill uh, fill that out, even whether or not they want to be a volunteer, I will get that, and then you could ask those questions through there. Yeah, but if you're on our mailing list, you should have received the newsletter yesterday mm -hmm. uh, in the evening, and you should have in also in received about seven o'clock um, central time, the invitation to this uh, this event. So if you did not receive that, maybe look in your different emails and see, double check if you're not already on it, please uh, sign up. We'd love to have you back. Yes, yes. All right, well, hopefully we will see everyone again next month. So have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.